Hello and welcome to New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Professor Michael Grubb. Michael is the Professor of International Energy and Climate Change Policy at University College London and he's written this book, Planetary Economics, Energy, Climate Change and the Three Domains of Sustainable Development. This came out about a, a year ago, I believe. Um, and um, let's start with um, what you consider to be the three domains of sustainable development. Well, the thing that most struck me in uh, taking time out and reflecting on 20 years in, in this field was that uh, policy has been struggling with great difficulty trying to tackle climate change. And that part of it is a, a lot of policy has been influenced by a, a pretty straightforward proposition that you're dealing with an externality, you needed to price the externality, and that would be kind of job done. And uh, where really the structure of the whole thinking that, that emerged there is there's one set of very big issues around the political economy of just trying to establish a price for something that was previously free. But in addition, the energy sector really is characterized by a big role for what uh, you know, 50 years ago we joined satisficing behavior, now more broadly known behavioral economics, the psychology of decision making, particularly in relation to energy use, it's, it's largely an invisible product for people, it's continuous, it's undifferentiable. People waste phenomenal amounts of energy. So there are huge opportunities for improving efficiency. And that whole behavioural area, how do real people behave? Seven billion energy consumers drive the global problems of energy environment. So that's the kind of first domain, first base. Um, at the other end, what I call the third domain really is the, the economics of transformation. We're talking about some of the biggest, most complex industrial systems on the planet, strong lock-in effects, a rich literature on evolutionary economics, um, which is not well linked to, again, the neoclassical idea that all you've got to do is set a price in a market and you solve the problem. So the three domains are actually a reference to the underpinning economic theories, respectively behavioral, neoclassical, and evolutionary or transformational. And the, the ultimate argument of the book is when you are trying to transform something as massive as the global energy system, driven by a very long-term complex externality, and indeed security uh, and equity issue as well, which is what climate change fundamentally is, you have to pull all three of those levers. You have to have policies that address all three of them. You have to understand their interactions. And the biggest reason, in my view, why we've failed to get to grips with these problems is because you've, you've had advocates of one or the other, but no sense of how do those bits all add up to make an integrated package. Let me drill down a little bit into some of this. Uh, the, the externalities that you discuss, um, they are not just uh, things that could be readily quantifiable. Sometimes there are contingent externalities, which and th those are harder to price. I, I, as an example, uh, you can consider a nuclear power plant. Of course, um, a lot of advocates of nuclear power will say, well, it's a very cheap, clean form of, of, of energy uh, because it's, it's relatively free of carbon emissions. But on the other hand, as we saw uh, in Japan a few years ago, you have a disaster of one kind or another with a nuclear power plant. That's a pretty substantial externality. It may not happen very often, but when it does, yep. the impact is, is, is catastrophic. Yeah. Well, when you come to look at what, what's the economic nature of the problem on climate change, uh, you get into very deep waters very quickly. First, you've got to be clear about the scope. What is it you're trying to measure? Is it market impacts, non-market impacts, social instability effects? Are you looking at smooth change, changes and extremes? You're talking about you know, physical tipping points, ocean turnovers and stuff. And what, what you really find looking at the literature trying to say, well, how serious is this problem from an economic standpoint is you've got all of that questions about scope. You then have a massive row about discounting, the principles of discounting, discount rates, vast literatures on that, which when you're talking about a century long problem often drive the answer. You have Weizmann's dismal theorem, which is effectively the whole thing could be dominated by fat tail risks anyway, which by definition you can never gather enough data in enough time to know what you're facing. Um, and the, the deep equity questions about what, what, how do we assign values to people at vastly different income levels in different places? What's our metric of aggregation here? So you, you draw rapidly to the conclusion that you know it's, it's kind of hard to characterize as a straightforward cost-benefit problem for an uncosted externality. It's much more subtle and ultimately it's a big question about global ethics and global security. Now you mentioned as well that the, the, uh, the, the, you, you touched on the distributional aspects. So clearly that there are uh, inequality implications which, which flow yeah. from this. Yeah, 
Yeah. Well, I think that um, one of the things that's most struck me as someone coming from a background as an energy economist uh, and engaging with the wider world macroeconomic debates um, of the sort that INET has been, been pursuing and delving into in great depth is I see several areas of intersection uh, and really quite profound. One obviously is around the treatment of systemic risks of the kind we saw with the financial crisis. Uh, Raghuram Rajan wrote a very interesting piece. You could almost take lock, stock and barrel what he was saying about the way we drove ourselves towards a precipice where it wasn't at all obvious who was at fault or why or anything, but we still headed for a precipice. It's exactly the situation in climate change. Again, equality, huge topic in economics now. One thing you can say about climate change, left unchecked, it will make whatever inequalities we have a lot worse for multiple reasons. It tends to be the poorer, more vulnerable, that are less able to cope with climate extremes, less protection against climate variability, extreme temperatures, you name it, the poor suffer first. So this will be an inequity multiplier and on yet a grand the, scale. The, the problem, of course, uh, in, in, in many respects, is that to deal with the policy response, it, it, that also might have a disproportionate in, impact. For example, if we tax carbon, uh, yeah. as, as one illustration, clearly someone who's on a, a, a marginal income is, will be affected by that much more than someone who's, who's making a million dollars a year. Yeah, and uh, one of the points I, I emphasize strongly in the book is that we've had, to my mind, an extraordinarily naive debate around carbon pricing. Because it's basically said, well, this is the efficient thing to do, so let's do it. Actually, it raises vast questions about equity internationally. Uh, you can make a strong case that a straight forward carbon price does not maximize utility because of its differential impact on the poor. It's regressive in developed countries. It's problematic in developing countries, and the political economy has been disastrous of actually trying to get carbon pricing in place. So if, if not a carbon tax, how do we send out the right uh, price signals? How do we do it? We, we tax on these well, negative externalities? I think there's, there's two big answers that I offer uh, in relation to that. Um, the first one actually stems from a, a third point of intersection with the macroeconomics of this issue. Um, I think it's now pretty widely acknowledged we have a systemic economic problem with a lot of credit in the global economy going to pretty unproductive uses, like asset bubbles and so forth. And meanwhile, you, you have a lot of capital sitting around earning very, very little interest at all, extraordinarily low rate, rates of return. Um, when you look at the economics of low carbon investment, you're dealing broadly with infrastructure finance, highly capital intensive, that will generate return over decades in the form of generating very low marginal cost power. So classic infrastructure finance. And you know a 5% rate of return, we could decarbonize huge amounts of the global economy if you can persuade capital to flow in that direction. And frankly, it would be more productive than what an awful lot of capital is going into at the moment. So I think the, the financial engineering of how you get capital to flow into low carbon investment is infinitely more subtle and promising than just let's whack a carbon price on and the economic system will deliver. You've, you've got to look at financial structures for long term investment in those kinds of assets. So in effect using tax policy to, 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 to drive investment? Tax or say. credit policy. I mean one of the emerging lines of debate is can or should we get a little bit more active in thinking about actually where does credit go to and is it going into productive assets of which low carbon investment would be a major task. I mean in Europe uh, we have around 14 trillion dollars sitting in institutional finance for example earning very little. The estimated investment requirement for the energy sector over the next decade is around a trillion euros. And that broadly productive investment which would give you know a, a very low marginal cost energy infrastructure for Europe. My second answer to your question, though, is about what do we need to do differently is to link these three domains. Mm -hmm. Because if all you do is rely on a price, you're effectively asking consumers to pay more. And when they say, why should we pay more for our energy? You say, trust us, we're economists, it's mm -hmm. sufficient. That is not a good political narrative. No. The alternate mm -hmm. narrative is, look, we have big structural inefficiencies in the way that people use energy. We have big structural inefficiencies in the innovation process in energy. When energy companies, the energy sector, 
spends about a twentieth as much on R&D per unit turnover as, say, pharmaceuticals. And there's there, there deep structural reasons for that. So huge potential for government involvement to accelerate innovation, to enhance efficiency. And my basic argument is, in terms of those three domains, is telling people, suffer this carbon price, trust us, it's the most efficient thing to do, is actually not only bad politics, it's inadequate economics. And the actual narrative that you can run is the role of carbon pricing in the process of transforming energy systems includes expenditure on substantially enhancing efficiency, where there's these multiple behavioral failures, infrastructural failures, etc., and accelerating innovation in one of the least innovative sectors in our economy. And that is a package which can also, by the way, potentially hold your energy bills constant, even as prices go up. And, and, and also could be a, a new source of exogenous growth for, for an, an yeah. economy. I, I, one of the things I, I delved into in the course of this book was looking at the debates around the solo growth model, the autonomous technological change, the, all the debates around endogenous change. It's an important part of economic growth. The energy sector is not an innovative sector. There which, is every is, prospect that making it more so would be beneficial. Which is not the way it's usually sold. I mean, uh, uh, historically, I think the way we've looked at this is, is that uh, the environment has acted in, in, in tension with the economic growth. We've, we've generally felt yeah. that it, somehow if we're dealing with environmental concerns that it, it derogates from economic growth. And somehow yeah. we've got to change that paradigm. Well, I, I suppose this whole exercise of stepping out for a couple of years and thinking pretty deeply and trying to read everything, look at the policy experience, is I simply don't believe that there's a trade-off between tackling climate change and economic growth. Um, sure, the, the classical mindset is, well, we, ha we have broadly optimizing economic, economic system, therefore any constraint, by definition, is going to cost. Well, no. I, we don't appear to have an optimizing energy system, and I'll leave it to other colleagues to say whether we have an, op an optimizing macroeconomic system, but I'm hearing great skepticism. <laughs> but in energy, we certainly do not. We have a system which has numerous structural problems, and more and more I see it as an evolutionary system. And the issue is, is it going to evolve in higher carbon, more risky, more dangerous directions, or is it going to evolve in lower carbon, more innovative, more engaged, more efficient? directions. That is not a macroeconomic trade-off. That's a policy-driven choice about the direction of one of the fundamental infrastructurally based systems on our planet. You uh, mentioned before uh, the comment of uh, RBI Governor Rajan's uh, comments uh, in which yep. he described the, 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 fi the, the, the financial crisis, which uh, a series of uh, incentives, perverse or otherwise, that drove us to, to that to precipice and then, then over. Um, and it, you su suggested it was a very useful analogy for what was happening in the environment uh, as well. Um, obviously, we had to wait until 2008 before the um, uh, sagacity of his uh, words were recognized. I, I wonder whether we are, the, the problem with a, a, an environmental crisis is it's, it's in some respects harder, it, it seems hard to believe, but it seems harder to, to um, define what that is. And it, it, yeah. you, I mean, you could argue, for example, you know, the rationing water in California, the, that should give you some. We've had Hurricane Sandy in New York. There, there have been ample warning signs, um, yeah. and, and yet uh, it's still, there's still a large element of denial, or there's a still a great reluctance to address these challenges in the way you outline in the book. There is, and I think that we have quite a deep problem of, of both political economy and sort of social perception and construction. And, uh, and there's, there's a growing literature on broadly the psychological distance of climate change. People cannot easily relate to something which is so big, so amorphous, so long term, so nested in uncertainties, which to a sort of a rational frame of risk management mind is boy, we're running big risk. We don't know what we are doing to the planet we are living on, and some of the possibilities are catastrophic. But the psychological reaction is, oh, it's all uncertain. I, I won't worry until they're sorted out. So, yeah, we have big psychological problems here, or, or, or big issues in terms of making it salient and politically in the ways that, that policymakers can address. I think there are, um, there are, however, some very important areas, partly of hope, uh, that we're making progress, not perhaps at the global level, but one looks at what some countries are doing, of which probably Germany, California, and, and increasingly China are as emerging at the forefront, are saying, well, oh, guys, this is, this is a challenge of industrial transformation and innovation. 
we can do that, we intend to do that, and we're going to make money out of doing it because everyone else will then have to follow. So that's one strand. It's a kind of semi-green growth type argument, but with the stimulation of a global challenge and being willing to lead that and lead the industrial response to it. I think I see one other big motivator emerging, um, which is intriguing me. Um, I was initially rather skeptical, but there's a big debate now about the carbon bubble. I mean, the size of the global, global economy, you know, 70 towards 80 trillion or so. The asset value of fossil fuels measured in the tens of trillions. And there's a complete mismatch. You could not have that asset value if you were serious about scientific targets on climate change. So people have talked about you know, this vast carbon bubble risk as if policymakers were going to suddenly turn around and say, oh, we're going to regulate carbon, mm -hmm. and now the asset value has collapsed. Well, I'm not sure the politics works that way. But on the other hand, the economics may work that what matters is not at what point do governments turn around and suddenly solve this problem, which is not going to happen that way, but at what, what point do the financial systems acknowledge actually we're moving towards solutions and these fossil fuels are never going to be used? Is that an asset bubble? Is that a financial, global financial risk? I think it could be. I think it could be quite a serious one. Um, and the longer we defer it, the bigger that risk will get, like other bubble risks. But you have a sense that we are moving in the right direction? I'm more optimistic than I've been for the last 10 years. That's, yes. That's very encouraging. And on that uh, note, uh, maybe we should uh, leave it. Again, uh, to find out much more, read the book. Again, it's uh, Michael Grubb, Planetary Economics, Energy, Climate Change, and the Three Domains of Sustainable Development. And it is available at stores almost everywhere. Mm. Thank you, Michael, for being with us today. Thank you very much.